Oh, we're back. It's another edition of the Orange Bloods Texas Football YouTube channel. I'm Jeff Ketchum, joined by Anwar Richardson. Do us a favor, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. If you haven't already done that, we're talking Texas football recruiting today. It's a bit of a slow day. We wanted to look back at the most recent commitments that the Longhorns picked up over the weekend. Connor Robertson and Cole Hudson, two offensive linemen, the first two real offensive linemen in this class. There was a lot of focus on the Longhorns not getting Kelvin Banks, the five-star offensive lineman out of the Houston area for good reason. He's the kind of guy that if you get enough of those changes programs, Anwar and Connor Robertson and Cole Hudson, the Longhorns get a low four-star and a high three-star who might as well be a, a low four star those that don't know i pretty much view those types of rankings as the same and don't feel like we should really quibble much about it because statistically they profile out as exactly the same the longhorns may not have gotten a couple of guys that you'd bank on to come in and definitely be a first or second day pick in the nfl draft but robertson and hudson are two guys the Texas offensive line coach Kyle Flood had identified from the very beginning as guys that he wants in this class. And it's no small thing that an offensive line class that wants to have five guys in it in December has two that I think they can feel like are pretty good building blocks towards what will eventually be the totality of this offensive line class. Yeah. And I think there's also something to be said, catch. And we've talked about this, uh, you know, a lot about, prospects from this from Austin area that actually leave and don't go to the University of Texas when they have an offer and that's kind of like usually a dig there so for them to be able to keep Connor Robertson home and keep him here I think that's it's you know really good sign for that staff and again Cole Hudson you know I would like to hear your evaluations actually on on both of those guys because I know you Cole is at the four star and, and, and obviously Connor's at the three, but I think they're really close. Like you said, as far as the rank is concerned. So maybe it's something that Connor gets bumped up to a four star, but you know, the one area of struggle for years catch and the probably it just predates me being here has been recruiting on the offensive line. You know, before we talked a lot about the quarterbacks and how there's been a struggle for years you know, to, to get those guys since Colt McCoy, offensive line recruiting catch every year I've been here. It's been all about the guys that Texas has missed. And yeah. there've been guys that they've been able to get, but those guys have developed those guys, you know, you you're able to get a couple of guys that developed into NFL players, but catch you. And I know that's usually not the formula, you know, it's usually going to be those, those four stars or five-star guys. So, um, you know, so it, I think it's a good start for them. Obviously there's still a lot more work to be done and there's still big fish out there. Uh, but I'm curious to do your analysis when you kind of broke down the film, what did you see in both of those guys? Well, let's start with Robertson, the local kid from Austin Westlake, who, you know, suddenly, you know, you're talking about a guy that's got a state championship ring on his finger. I thought he was one of the better players in the state title game against South Lake Carroll. The thing that you'll notice about Robertson, I think right off the bat is that he's a really physical guy. I mean, he finishes his blocks. He is at the point of attack right where you want him to be. And I think because of his physicality that he's a guy that could at 6'4", 295, show up on campus. He's 300 plus pounds. And I think could probably earlier than Hudson find his way onto a two deep in the, inside uh, within the offensive line, because I think physically – he's closer to that physicality needed at this level. I think it comes a little bit more natural to Roberts. And I think the thing that you notice about Connor is that he just has some limitations physically that his pass blocking is, I think a work in progress, mostly just because he has some physical limitations. I mean, if he were a little more athletic. We'd be talking about a guy that might be able to do what Kelvin Banks might be able to do, which is play right tackle at the next level. And I think his value as a prospect changes a little bit. I think he's an interior guy. I don't think he has the footwork to play at tackle. I might be proven wrong and maybe, maybe they give him a chance, but he looks like a pure interior guy for me. But I think a guy that in time has a chance to be a really good college player. And again, of the two guys, I think Robertson profiles maybe as an early contributor more than Hudson Hudson for me at six, five, three, 15 
very similar to Robertson in that he just doesn't, I think, have the natural footwork and athleticism to play tackle. He's a pure inside guy. But the thing that's really unique about Hudson, and when Alex Dunlap did a review on him a couple of months ago, it may have even been more recent than that, one of the things that stood out to me was how similar our profiles were of him uh, in terms of what his strengths are as a player. Hudson, they use him on counters. They'll pull him on traps. They'll, they'll, they'll get him out on the edge on sweeps. He's not really athletic, yet he has an incredibly special skill of being able to find guys in space and get on them. And it usually doesn't work that way. Usually if you ask a guy who has limited athleticism in his scouting report to be successful playing in space in the run game, those two things typically go hand in hand, athleticism and the ability to get into open field and make blocks. Hudson is incredible in these scenarios. You get him in space, he finds linebackers, he finds Whatever his assignment is, he finds a way to actually get his body onto them and make a block. He's not one of these guys that you pull him in space. I was a little bit like this in high school. Pull him in space and, you know, he can, he can run yard for yard with, I wouldn't say I was this way, but you can watch some old highlight tapes from me from 25 years ago. And I'm running not too far behind my wide receiver who's caught a touchdown and run like 60 yards, but I didn't block anybody. It's a hard skill. It's hard to get into space and find a moving target and to get on that guy and make blocks. It's one of the toughest thing that offensive linemen have to do. Hudson does a really good job of it. And I can't even really explain it other than to say he has a natural ability to do this thing, even though you know, I don't know that his, his physical attributes would suggest that he would be a plus player in this kind of scenario when he really is. I mean, it sounds, I appreciate that. It sounds like a really good breakdown. It's interesting as you're, you're talking catch and I looked and I see that, you know, with these additions, you know, Texas is, is ranked ninth, uh, according to rivals right now, that class and with 14 commits and I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head catch as I'm looking through the commitment list and, and again, I'm, I'll, I'll, I want to see what you think, because I, I think I have an answer, but I want to hear yours first. Who's who's the gem right now? Like, who's the person that you like guaranteed take it to the bank? Who's the who's the star of it? Because it's it's fascinating, right? You, you've got a, a kicker and a long snapper that's on this list. We've talked about Malik Murphy in, in the previous video about the development that needs to, to happen over there. Uh, Jaden Blue was was good. He's, he's not playing in his senior season. Uh, you've talked about Connor Robertson being kind of a, a developmental guy. Um, in who who's the guy? Who's who's your guy right now? I think Malik Murphy's the best prospect in this class. That doesn't mean that he's the best player. I think <laughs> you and I did a video yesterday where we went in depth. And if you didn't check out our Malik Murphy uh, video here on the channel coming out of the elite 11 camp from yesterday, check it out. It's good stuff. We went, we, we had a really long conversation about Malik Murphy. I thought there's some really good conversation there. Jaden blue. You know, yeah. we can forget about the noise around him. Jaden blue is a guy that I think has borderline five-star talent as a running back. I say borderline because this year, when he, this year in the hundred meters, he didn't run. He wasn't slow. But I mean, he wasn't five star fast either. I mean, you know, you got to be to me breaking 10 5, 10 6, and he wasn't consistently doing that. And when he went to regionals, he was closer to the 10 9 mark than he was these other. So that to me, you know, the, 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 the stopwatch don't lie. So in a world where his, where his speed's a little better, then I think that you'd probably talk about Jaden Blue from a talent standpoint in that kind of company. Outside of that, look, this is a Texas recruiting class. When you look at the rivals rankings, they have two kids. So Malik Murphy's from the state of California, so he doesn't count. But they've got Jalen Gilbo and Armani Winfield 
who are 5.9 level four stars. That means they're mid four stars. But when you look at Gilbo on the state rankings for rivals, they've got him at 26th in the state. When you look at um, Winfield and click on his profile, he's number 24 in the state. The highest ranked prospect in the current commitment class for the Longhorns in the state of Texas, according to the rivals rankings is Armani Winfield at 24. That's not good enough. It's not good enough. So it's a class right now that I think has depth with a lot of really good prospects because, you know, BJ Allen and Zach Swanson and Hudson and Robertson, who we're talking about and Jamarian Miller, those are very good prospects but they're not in those two sets of tiers, five stars and high four stars that profile is completely different. You are more likely to be drafted in the 10 times as likely to be drafted in the first round of the NFL draft as a five star than you are as a four star. You're like 200 times more likely to be drafted in the first round I think it might actually be like 500 times more likely versus like a two star. Like it's not just about being drafted at all. The thing that separates five stars and four stars is that when they get drafted, they almost always get drafted in the first three rounds. And then once the first three rounds are over, you'd be amazed at how few go rounds four, five, six, and seven. It's just not very many year in and year out. The big guys, they all go early. And those are the guys that wins Alabama championships. Those are the guys that get LSU to win a championship. We could talk about Joe Burrow, and he got him over the top, but you can't ignore the fact that from a, on the defensive side of the ball, in that offensive line, and that was an LSU team that had pro guys everywhere. And it helps when you're pulling in top three recruiting classes consistently. This class doesn't have, this class is not going to finish in the, the, in the top 10. It's ninth now. It will not finish inside the top 10 unless they land some of these difference makers that Kelvin Banks registered as. The reason why he was so important is because he's, He's in the tier of recruiting that if he pans out, he gets drafted early. The difference between these other guys is if they pan out, they may end up being good players. If Banks pans out, he's getting drafted on either Thursday or Friday. It's a different profile. Texas doesn't have enough guys like that. And it's one of the reasons why you come away from a situation like this weekend where the Longhorns picked up two offensive line commits, right? This video is about Robertson um, and Hudson in theory, but it, the reason why Texas fans came away from this weekend talking about the one that they didn't get versus the two that they did is the one they didn't get just has a profile that, quite frankly, belongs in a separate conversation than the guys that we're talking about today. The last thing I'll say, you know, on the, on the subject, those are really, you know, good points, uh, you know, catch that you, you brought out. And it's very fascinating that the, the belief was that this would, they, this staff had the, the ability to do a top five class. Now you're saying potentially that's outside of the top 10. And that goes back to some of the videos that, you know, if people are watching, they can go back to, we've talked about the importance of winning and what that means. That was part of our overreaction Monday uh, conversation with banks. Um, it's going to be very interesting that going forward catch as we monitor uh, to this stuff, you know, to see the guys that they want to that potentially close on, see if those guys hold on. I guess that's what has to be the hope that you got to hope that guys decide like I'll just wait until the season before making a final visit, a decision rather, maybe take another official visit and maybe potentially uh, close strong. But the my my closing thing is is a question of the guys that are left from a recruiting perspective. And in these conversations, I'd refer to you, you defer to you and your recruiting expertise. Who was who are the guys that are left on the board that you feel like is either a must get for Texas 
or a t- if they're not a must get, just guys that you say this is no hell must gets for Texas. I think there are five left in the state. Okay. And I say only five because I'm realistic. I'm taking realistic chances into the equation. I mean, there's a hell of a lot of five stars still left on the table, you know, from a five. I think there are legitimately 10 five stars in the state of Texas this year, but of those guys, I don't know that tech. I mean, Texas A&M is the favorite to get bear Alexander. Texas A&M and or Ohio State is the favorite to get Cam Dewberry. Alabama is probably the favorite to get Duncanville defensive lineman Omari Bohr. And so there's three uncommitted guys that Texas just isn't really in the race for. I think the number one guy, the single biggest must have the rest of the way is Arlington Bowie offensive guard Devin Campbell. There He is along with Banks and Dewberry, and he's he's a five-star. He is a guy that is in conversation with being the best player and prospect at his position and in the state this year. He's in that conversation. What happens in his recruitment is kind of hard to, to decide right now because Texas is a school that is, I think, presumed to be the leader, but they were also presumed to be the leader for Kelvin Banks. Two... <laughs> four days ago so um you know like i don't know like i'm taking a stand back from the guys that i think texas is viewed as a leader or co-leader with and realizing okay they're waiting later in the year this season's going to have an impact so what does it mean at the end of the year if devin campbell is making a decision between texas and say oklahoma and this season takes place and he goes into it favoring Texas, but maybe wanting to see something. I don't know what it means if he doesn't see it. So it's hard to forecast, but Campbell's won. Uh, Denver Harris, the cornerback from North Shore, Texas versus Alabama battle there. The exact same conversation that I just had with Devin Campbell. Texas is probably considered a co-leader at this point, but he's waiting and wanting to see something from Texas. You have to think they will not get him. If he's waited, he could have already committed to Texas if he just desperately wanted to be a Longhorn. He's in the category of a guy that's waiting to see what Texas does this year. And until they do it, I think you have to be very careful about, and I have Denver Harris future casted to Texas. I think if I hadn't done that, it was like, I'll, I'll hold out and wait before changing it. But if I was starting all over again today, I might put it in for Alabama. The other guys that are absolute must-haves, Evan Stewart, the wide receiver out of Frisco Liberty, he was once a Texas commitment. Alabama and Florida are the main two schools in competition for Stewart. Although, you know, I mean, he's not going to make a decision until later in the year. Another school could be added to the mix. There's some thought that A&M is going to get a lot of guys to come in on the weekend of the Alabama game. Guys, Denver Harris among them. The thought being that if a kid's interested in Alabama, he can go to A&M and see Alabama in person this year at a game that's going to be one of the best in the country in college football, but he'll also be seeing A&M. And I think there are a couple of guys that aren't really in on that a and super in on right now that I wonder if the type of season that they're talking about having, and I'm not saying it's going to happen, but if they did have a year or they're just even in the playoff mix. I think that's a guy you're going to have to keep an eye on that maybe if there's a dark horse team that nobody's talking about for uh, Evan Stewart, maybe that happens. I think the other guys, Brennan Thompson, an athlete from Spearman, really tough to handicap his recruitment right now because he hasn't been to many places. And then you've got Bryce Anderson, the safety from Beaumont Westbrook, who's next in line. These they have To get a top 10 class, to me, they got to get these five guys. You All start missing on, you start, they, they needed to get five out of six when this list had Kelvin Banks on it. And now they don't have Banks. So now it went from, you got to get five out of six. There's only five left. They need to get all five of these guys. And if they don't, unless they kill it in out-of-state recruiting, this will be a class that TCU would love. 
Oklahoma State would love everybody, but in, in some years, maybe even Oklahoma would love, but it won't have impact recruits on it. And what it will mean is that as this recruiting class comes in, the real realistic expectations that you could have for them is that they're making an impact in 2023 and 2024 and not immediately, which is when people follow recruiting, they don't get all jazzed up because they think a guy might help out in three or four years. They love the big time recruits because the idea is you can slide them in right away and have a big time guy added to your program. These guys got to cook in the oven at 350 for like 30 minutes. And that might mean that in 2022 and 2023, they're just not part of the group that would be needing to take Steve Sarkeesian's program to a big 12 championship. Well, I would just say this uh, catch up all the guys that you, you named um, and all of them are super talented, right? Every single one of them uh, as a guy who loves receivers. I love Evan Stewart. I, I just, I, I that, 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 that guy is a burner. That guy knows how to get open. I love his footwork, his hands, like everything about him. Now, Yes, if, if Malik Murphy plays with Evan Stewart, yes, we probably have a different conversation, right? Um, but I, of all those guys, I understand the importance of, you know, the Bryce Andersons and, and Devin Campbells. And I've just talked about like one of my favorite on the list. Um, you know, it's probably that guy. I think the, the, the tough part for me in that conversation is that Stewart was committed to Texas. And I don't know, Catch, I don't always see a lot of guys that decommit and then come back. You know, it just seems – it seems like one of those things that you just could have stayed committed if you were really into it and then just take visits, which happens a lot. So it's, I don't know if this is a new thing, trend in recruiting catch, because back in my day, which seems like only two years ago or three years ago, guys were just committed and they just took visits. And then, you know, you remember Charlie used to call it making reservations, you know, and then guys were just making reservations. And now, like I see with the Ruben Owens or Evan Stewart, they're like, they're, we're, I'm just opening it back up. And I just I think, don't, I, there's, someone's got to explain that to me, but it's, it's just fascinating how that works now. I think it's a unique situation in that Evan Stewart's a perfect example. Let's just use him. He gave a commitment when he'd never made an on-campus visit to any of the schools that he was looking at. He is, you know, he's like a pandemic baby, but if, if baby's like a high school football prospect, he started all these guys that made decisions before June in the 2022 class made decisions without ever like seeing people face to face. Sure. And so I think every single kid that gave a com look, if you were, if you're a legacy, if you just have been dying your entire life to play at school a, and then you got the opportunity and you committed, you're in a little bit of a different territory. But 95% of these guys don't fall into the category of grew up, going to games, knew where they wanted to go. This is it. Anybody that gave an early commit did so without taking visits. And I think it was pre. And I, what do you tell these guys? Because they're surrounded by people who are constantly saying, you got to commit, you got to get your spot, reserve a spot, get an insurance policy. Like there's all of these things, these pressures that I think a lot of these kids felt to jump on a scholarship offer to reserve a spot, but then they get to this point and now they can go face to face again. And it's like, Oh, maybe I do need to look around a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think what specifically happened with Evan Stewart is I don't think he realized how big time he was. I think Texas offers and you're like, Whoa. Mm -hmm. and, and you're like, Oh, wait a minute. Nick Saban is calling me. And you're like, Florida wants me to come visit. And suddenly you're like, I kind of want to see what that's about. Yeah. And I just think that a guy like Evan Stewart committed to Texas and didn't, it's kids here, like you're going to be recruited, but you, you can name the program that you want to go to. But I'll never forget talking to Sergio Kendall back in the day, the first interview that he ever did about recruiting. And he gave me Missouri and Oregon as his top two. And I was like, Huh, and this is before Oregon blew up. And I was like, why Missouri and Oregon? He was like, oh, because I'm not good enough to play anywhere else. I'm like, well, no, you are. <laughs> You're the number <laughs> one player in the state. And yeah. eventually it changes. And I think Evan Stewart, same thing. I think you can tell a guy, you're going to be recruited by everybody, hold off. And, but it feels completely different when your high school coach is like, hey, 
Nick Saban's on the phone. He, he wants to talk to you right now. And that has a way of mind blowing kids fairly. I mean, I would, I'm not judging anybody in that situation, but if you're asking how it happens, I think this year you had a bunch of guys that committed that really shouldn't have, but what are you going to do? Shut down the entire industry because nobody knew when guys were even going to be able to visit. And then you've got a very, really small category of guys like Evan Stewart who are just bigger than they thought they were. And then they realized it. And then they had to find it. Ruben Owens is exactly the same way. Sounded great to commit. Yeah. And he was like, I kind of want to go to Alabama and just hang. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and he wanted to go to Florida and, and, and yeah. see what that was like. He wants, and, that, and he wants to do it like 15 more times. Oh, he, I think Ruben Owens is going to be the guy that commits the day of. And oh. I, it is going to be, I, I think that, I think Ru, I've interviewed Ruben Owens and uh, we did it prior to the YouTube channel and it's, it's on the podcast and, you know, but it was interesting. Like we, we were talking through Zoom and I get to see him and I, I got the sense that Ruben Owens likes being, you know, he likes being recruited. I think he likes that attention that he gets. And he's yeah. from a small town. So, you know, you're, you're small town living and you've got everybody across the country showing you love. I mean, yeah. the guy tells me how he rides a horse. They, they, he rides a horse around town. So for <laughs> that guy who literally showed me a horse in, in the, behind him and during our interview, like that guy is like, yeah, man, I need, I need, hey, Sark, my, my bad, dude. He's taking his horse to like the local trough where his boys are hanging out at. And they're like, Hey, how was Alabama this weekend? And he's yeah. like the girls, <sighs> like it doesn't, he's from a, pl a place that doesn't see this very often. So for him to be a rock star for the next couple of years, is probably the biggest thing in his hometown in a really long time. But look, we got many more days to talk about these kids. I want to thank Connor Robertson and Cole Hudson for giving us an idea that was less about talking about them specifically for 30 minutes and more about talking about them specifically and then getting in to a whole bunch of other recruiting talk. It's kind of the way Anwar and I do things. We start one place, we end another. This is the end of the video. Do us a solid. Hit the like. Subscribe if you haven't already done that. We'll be back tomorrow with more video content right here on the Orange Bloods Texas Football YouTube channel. Later.